So we're going to talk through something that uh, is a follow-up to a recent video and it comes up quite often and it, it's something that I think it can help to uh, go over outside of uh, a visit with a provider so that you have a little time to uh, kind of think and then go off and research options if they seem uh, appealing to, to you. And that is what are the general treatment options for the symptoms associated with menopause. There are a number of, uh, of things that can have benefit here. By far the probably the, the mainstay is hormone replacement therapy, which is uh, broken down into two groups. You have unopposed estrogen. This is only an option in uh, women who have had a hysterectomy. If there is an intact uterus in place, then they will need to have both estrogen and some type of progestin or progesterone. Um, the goal of hormone replacement therapy is really to decrease symptoms that are bothersome. Uh, hot flashes, sleep di disturbances, um, anxiety and depression symptoms. Uh, some will say that it helps with uh, arthralgias and, and joint aches and pains. Um, it's not really recommended to try to treat osteoporosis or coronary artery disease or for prevention of dementia, but there may be some benefits in these areas that are worth weighing in when making a, a decision about whether or not this is a, a reasonable treatment option. So in general, for those that are within 10 years of menopause or age less than 60, I think this is something that is, is considered a safe and reasonable option. Um, there are some caveats. You do want to avoid use if you have a history of breast cancer, coronary artery disease, uh, history of blood clots, either what are called deep venous, throm deep venous thromboses, or uh, DVTs or PEs or pulmonary emboli. Um, history of stroke, history of active liver disease, these would also uh, cause you to want to avoid um, hormone replacement therapy. And then in general, there's some other risk factors out there that are not as common. So it's a, a conversation you're gonna wanna have with your provider. Um, how long can you take this? Well. Three to five years is, is the baseline recommendation, but you can consider longer use in persistent severe hot flashes. If you try to come off of it and, and you're getting significant symptoms, probably a good idea to try to uh, go and look at some of the non-hormonal uh, options and try those but it is possible and reasonable in some cases to come back and use the lowest effective dose of the hormone um, replacement therapy uh, to, to try to control really bothersome symptoms. So estrogen, uh, all types are pretty much equally effective uh, for treating hot flashes. 17-beta-estradiol, um, or more commonly referred to as estradiol, uh, is preferred over other formulations because it's uh, uh, pretty similar to what's naturally occurring in the body. Uh, it must be prescribed with a progestin if there is a uterus present. Um, transdermal um, methods of, delivery, of delivering the medicine is more preferential if you have a uh, history of uh, elevated or significantly elevated triglycerides, active gallbladder disease, or any type of known thrombophilia, which is kind of a, a blood disorder that increases your risk of forming blood clots. So if you had uh, factor V Leiden is probably the most common, but there, uh, this would prompt you to ask your, your physician about it if you had a family history of uh, clotting disorders or blood clots. Um, progestin is required to really to treat 
or to prevent endometrial hyperplasia, the lining of the uterus from growing and potentially developing um, problems uh, if the uterus is still present. Uh, can also have some benefit in controlling um, hot flashes, but really not used that way much anymore. Um, micronized progesterone seems to be the most uh, effective plus really to have the least risk of breast cancer, coronary artery disease uh, when compared to other preparations. So it's probably, even if it's similar in effectiveness, it's probably safer. So that's the, the generally recommended formulation. Non-hormonal options um, are uh, something that, that really ought to be thought through because frequently these uh, are effective and can um, avoid having to take the hormones uh, and can be um, you know, very safe, I think, valid options to consider. Paroxetine, or brand name Paxil, actually has an approval from the FDA for uh, treatment of um, menopausal or postmenopausal symptoms. And it's, it's a pretty safe uh, SSRI type antidepressant, anti-anxiety medication that's been around for a long time and is a reasonable one to consider. Other similar medicines, uh, venlafaxine or Effexor, desvenlafaxine, which is Pristique, um, citalopram, which is Celexa, escitalopram, which is Lexapro, uh, also have some benefit in this area and can be considered, um, but they don't have a specific um, FDA approval for this. Uh, for some reason, uh, sertraline, which is Zoloft, and uh, fluoxetine, which is Prozac, uh, doesn't seem to have the same benefit. Gabapentin, which is um, actually designed as a seizure medication, uh, can be helpful, especially at nighttime, in uh, helping to reduce symptoms of hot flashes. So that's one that you might want to consider. Oxybutynin, uh, which is a um, medication for overactive bladder, uh, can be effective to some degree in helping with symptoms, so it's something to consider, especially if overactive bladder problems are also present. Uh, phytoestrogens, or, or um, kind of chemicals that are similar to uh, estrogens that are found in some plant foods have been touted as being helpful, but the evidence here is, is not great. Um, black cohosh is uh, similar. It, it is a uh, supplement that has been uh, touted as being effective, um, probably reasonably safe and, and okay to try for most women. You would want to talk to your provider to make sure they were okay with it, but it is um, probably not as beneficial as some of the more regulated um, medical options. Yoga, stress management, relaxation, all of those are also things that you can consider um, and, and certainly would be safe options if they can be effective and you can avoid medicine. In general, avoiding medication is, is a good idea. So I think this gives you just a, a brief overview and hopefully gives you the information to let you go discuss with your provider and to try to figure out what is the best options for you. I hope you found value in the information we went over today. If you did, please click below to subscribe, click the bell to receive notifications if you would like, and give us a thumbs up. Please remember this is for education and entertainment. It is not to take the place of spending time in conversation with your healthcare provider. You've been entrusted with a very valuable gift. You're only going to have one body. Please put the time and effort in to take care of it. I hope you have a blessed day.